Well, it is 731. We are continuing to monitor the path of Hurricane Dorian as it makes its way up the uh, east coast here in the United States. We have correspondents all up and down the coast, and we've been checking in with them uh, throughout the morning. But in the meantime, as we get closer to the 2020 race, we are beginning to learn more about where the Democratic candidates stand on the issue of climate change. Last night, CNN held a town hall addressing the issue that's likely to be one of the most critical in 2020. For more on last night's town hall now, I am joined by uh, CBS News climate change and weather contributor Jeff Rodelli, as well as CBS and political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns. Thank you so much. So we've got both sides. We've got the politics and we've got the science. Uh -huh. I want to start with you, Caitlin, because when I heard about this town hall that mm -hmm. went on for many, many hours, mm -hmm. I thought, they're just going to be saying the same thing over and over yeah. again. Yeah. What stood out to you? Well, what stood out to me originally was that the uh, cable network was dedicating seven hours yeah. to right. this issue. Yeah. I think that this shows uh, how big of an issue this is in politics right now, especially in the Democratic side. Um, Right, they couldn't be on stage at the same time because of DNC rules, so it was a few repetitive things. But what stood out to me largely was you have some candidates who are advocating for big structural change to address this issue, and you have others who want to take a more what they call realistic approach. And I think voters are going to be kind of deciding uh, which candidate kind of fits their views. Mm -hmm. But all of these candidates are making clear that they want to make this a priority. Nearly all of them said that they want want to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord on day one. Uh, they talked about a lot of their plans. There aren't huge differences in their plans. The biggest differences, I would say, relate to, you know, how long it would take to get to net zero carbon mm -hmm. emissions. Others have, you know, multiple kinds of price tags. So those are the big differences. I would also say that look out for uh, how these candidates are are connecting with donors. Uh, Joe Biden, of course, came under criticism last night for hosting a fundraiser that's set for today with someone who has ties to the fossil mm -hmm. fuel industry. Mm. So look for that maybe to be an issue on the debate stage that's next week. That's very interesting. So, Jeff, you know, we heard some of the candidates, including, I think, Elizabeth Warren, I remember hearing her say, listen, you know, this is about much more than, you know, banning plastic straws. What are the key components of a plan that you listen for? Because you know about this yeah. thing. The kitchen sink. Everything. Honestly, yeah. the kitchen sink. I don't think people realize how much of a Herculean task this is going to be. So to kind of pit regulation uh, versus versus market forces is almost disingenuous. We need both. We need everything. That's how hard this is going to be. We have 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. By the end of the century, we'll have 10 billion people in the world, uh, a, a lot of whom are, are considered poor right now. They will be middle class pretty soon. And when they mm. are, their energy consumption goes from literally one unit to 15 times that. So the point is, we need a lot more energy. So we need everything. So we're going to need either a carbon tax and, and a carbon tax or a, a cap and trade, either one, but we need one of them. Mm. Uh, so those are the market forces that will be in place. Uh, and then we also need just about everything else. We need to invest in a lot of new technology. We probably need to stop fracking and, and drilling for oil. Uh, in addition, we probably should stop subsidies to the fossil fuel industry gradually over time. Mm. Uh, literally, we need, we need just about everything uh, to get this done. This is a moonshot times I would say a thousand, but it's probably a moonshot times a million. A moonshot times a million. Wow. Yeah. Um, but it's important. It's important to voters. Yeah. We've done a lot of polling of Democratic voters, and mm -hmm. uh, it, the, for sure the majority of them think that this is a key issue. I just got at least one of our polls here. A CBS mm -hmm. News poll found that 68% of Democrats say that they must hear a candidate's position on reducing global warming before they vote for them. How important will this issue be in the election? It's huge for Democrats, and that ranks second highest to health care mm -hmm. in our polling, which kind of shows how big of an issue this is for mm -hmm. Democrats and how quickly this has become an issue. In the exit polling that CBS did after the 2018 midterms, this didn't even register mm -hmm. as a top five concern. For Democrats, this is huge. Voters ask about it over and over on the campaign trail. Mm -hmm. And because it encompasses multiple aspects of their lives, yes, young people especially yes. are concerned about the, the effects of climate change that will happen in their own lifetime. Mm -hmm. But it also speaks to other issues, jobs, infrastructure, uh, justice. Mm -hmm. um, all you that mentioned, stuff. It's all together. Um, you know, these candidates last night, a lot of them talked about the effects on minority communities, mm -hmm. uh, disadvantaged communities, mm -hmm. negatively and disproportionately affecting people. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an all-encompassing way to talk about these various issues issues 
issues that are at the forefront of the primary. You know what I thought when I sort of listened to the price tags in particular mm -hmm. that we're talking in the trillions and mm -hmm. trillions of dollars. Now we've done a lot of polling here at CBS of Democrats because you know it's, Demo right. it's the Democratic candidates that are that are running right now. I don't know where Republicans stand on this as as a priority issue, mm -hmm. but I would think that some of these fiscally conservative Republicans mm -hmm. here trillions of dollars and probably start to tune out a little bit. Absolutely. And you saw a lot of uh, Trump campaign officials kind of criticizing a lot of these Democrats last night mm -hmm. for some of these proposals, especially focusing on plastic straws and, and, and those items. Um, what is interesting, though, is you're starting to see some Republicans acknowledge that they have to, as a party, mm -hmm. address this kind of thing, especially against the backdrop of Dorian. Mm -hmm. Hearing from some of these Republican lawmakers and governor uh, and senators in Florida. Um, this is an issue that they know they have to address at some point. So that's what we'll be watching for is kind of the shift in this. I talked to a Republican lawmaker from Louisiana a couple of months ago who said that the, the party has to um, start doing something on this because his state especially is affected. Um, I want to play a soundbite from uh, Kamala Harris uh, from last night. She was asked about emissions from cars and uh, cutting them. This is what she had to say. By my plan, by 2045, we will have um, basically zero emission vehicles only, 100%. By 2045. 2045. All right, let's and, go. And, and, and let me add one more thing, Erin, mm -hmm. and also um, school buses. So part of my plan mm -hmm. is that by 2030, we will have electric school buses. 25 million children in our country a day ride school buses, smelling those fumes. These are real issues, and again, we can do something about it. So a lot of candidates have pledged uh, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by mm -hmm. 2040, 2050. Is that a realistic goal? First of all, the idea of net zero is that you're not completely eliminating fossil fuels necessarily, but you're at least sucking out or absorbing as much as you're emitting, so you're kind of at a, a zero. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's possible. I'm glad you explained that. Right. Because, mm -hmm. so, you know, people will see, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of wealthy people uh, flying uh, jets around yeah. and, and, and compensating for it in other ways. Right. And so I'm glad you sort of explained that plus minus. Right, and there's some value in, in purchasing those offsets, I think. Right. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that we pretty much need to do everything here. Yeah. And is it realistic? It has to be. It has to be realistic, right? We, we have to save <laughs> the world, so do we have much of a choice? Uh, yeah, it can be done, but again, we need everyone's buy-in. We need industry, we need government, and we need people like you and me. Citizens have to take some responsibility. And when you see your neighbor get solar panels or drive a, a, a vehicle that doesn't cost them any money because they're not paying for gas every day, you start to jump on that bandwagon. So it's about forming habits and spread, like the pet rock back in the 1960s. For some reason, everyone had a pet rock. Right. We need to make this our pet rock. And the point is, this needs to be a trendy thing, and it's becoming so with the kids. So I think this is, a, this is happening. Mm. It needs to happen fast. Can it happen? Yes. Will it be a, a big lift? A tremendous one. Mm. Can we afford to fail? Absolutely not. Mm. Jeff and Caitlin, thank you so much for contributing to this. You're welcome. Thank you.